very much, Sri <clears throat> and Rajesh Shah, for inviting me to speak today in the SCTS University. Um, I gave this a provocative title because um, as I was talking to Jim McWicken, the operative procedure of VAT sympathectomy is now being deemed as of low clinical value. And in the United Kingdom, um, I don't know how many do VAT sympathectomies in their units. Can I have a show of hands, please? Excellent. Um, now what I want to also know is whether any of you, when you have to do a patient, have to fill in a set of forms which is about 10 pages long. How many have to do that? None. So that's excellent. Because in our CCG, they've decided that they will not fund it. And therefore, whenever we need to um, get a patient onto our waiting list, we've got to fill in for our funding. <clears throat> so I just want to make a case that this is not a operative procedure of low clinical value. Now I want to deal with this with the background to the three sets of patients that I have operated on over the last 15 years, the methodology of the uh, results that we published, how I do it, <clears throat> and the reasons for doing it, the results, the follow-up, and discussion. Now, we all know from the show of hands that this is an established procedure in the United Kingdom, and this is done for patients with mainly hyperhidrosis, palmar, axillary, and some patients which are being dealt with for facial flushing. And I had a um, subspecialist practice with my cardiologist at the Heartlands for patients with intractable angina. Now, various techniques have been described using clips, diathermy, and excision um, to perform the operative procedure. Not advancing. Right. I want to report our experience of the first 100 patients who had resection of the T2 to T4 sympathetic ganglia. And I also made it a point to remove the rami communicantus as at the time, reading the literature, I found that there were quite a few patients who were coming back with recurrences and clips were being removed. The um, <clears throat> patients were having redo operative procedures. And having visited Michael Mack, um, who at that time in 1997 performed sympathectomies too, believe it or not, and uh, in, advised me that to take out a segment is probably the best way of performing this operative procedure as you can then have histological proof of having done the procedure and having a complete sympathectomy. So we did a retrospective review. I think Sri was involved in the study as well. And we looked at the 200 procedures that were carried out in Birmingham between a 10-year period. And after 2007, it became a trickle simply because of funding issues in the center. And if you look at the uh, distribution, they were equal with 47 males and only 53 females with a mean age of 32 years. And these were the groups that we had, mainly for hyperhidrosis, PAMAR, um, some with facial flushing and hyperhidrosis, and we had 26 patients who were um, <clears throat> done for angina. And I just want to um, give you a little background of these patients who were referred to me with intractable angina. These were patients who had discussed in an MDT by the cardiologists and cardiac surgeons who found that these patients didn't have any targets and had end vessel disease, which was not amenable to any conventional myocardial revascularization procedures. And therefore, <clears throat> patients who are on maximal anti therapy were then 
passed on to me to perform a transthoracic sympathectomy. Now, we scored these patients in three grades, one with minimal impact on their quality of life, two who had significant impact, and three who had severe impact. And we got patients who came to the um, outpatients clinic who were working in precision instruments plants who needed very fine uh, tactile sensation when they were working, but because of their problems with Palmer hyperhidrosis, they couldn't perform their work. They all, we also had students who uh, came to the clinic when they put their hands out, they were dripping. These were the kind of patients that we decided we needed to take on. You probably saw, um, I'll just show you the video. What I tend to do is to cut the nerve, and I wanted to show you this particular video, which I think has some mistakes. I used diathermy shears, and the diathermy shears, which were used to cut the proximal end, I ended up causing heat dissipation proximal to the nerve, giving rise to transient horners. So I stopped doing that after the first few patients came back with what looked like Horner's syndrome, but then subsided within four to six weeks. So therefore, I stopped cutting the proximal <clears throat> sympathetic nerve chain without using the diathermy shears. I also made sure that each of the ramus which I lifted were also cut so that we had a complete sympathectomy rather than a partial sympathectomy. And I made sure that I didn't go anywhere near the pad of fat which lay, which lies really on the first rib. Now, if you see that, there's the rami communicatus, which enters into the intercostal groove. I cut that. And here's a mistake where I cut with the diathermy scissors, which causes heat dissipation to go proximally. So I stopped doing that <clears throat> and found that the incidence of what I thought was Horner syndrome subsided. I tend to use a Redivac drain because I didn't want, I know Jim doesn't use a drain. He reinflates the lung and tends to get an X-ray the same day and discharge the patient. But I had one or two instances of pneumothorax and therefore I did not um, have the guts to not drain these patients. That's the radiovac drain that I place in the apex of the chest. Help me to advance this. Yeah. So all of these patients were extubated on the table and were nursed in the thoracic ward. They didn't go to the high dependency unit. <clears throat> but the angina group were uh, transferred to the coronary care where we did troponin levels to make sure that we hadn't done any perioperative damage as they were an early group of patients. And they remained for about four to five days. They got ECGs done on a daily basis. Um, and were then sent home on the fifth post-operative day. The Redivac drains were removed the day after the operation if the lungs were satisfactorily expanded. Follow-up was on outpatient's visit, and we did a medical notes review, and a telephone interview was carried out by the registrars to, for um, recording the quality of life. Patients were asked to rate their operative um, outcome as one for no change, two for satisfactory, and three to denote if there was a significant 
improvement and its impact on their quality of life. So these are my results. We had 99 patients who had bilateral procedures and one which had a unilateral procedure because of dense adhesions and I couldn't carry out uh, a bilateral operative procedure. There was one conversion to thoracotomy in the angina group due to previous decortication. <clears throat> and the median postoperative length of stay was 2.4 days for the facial flushing and hyperhidrosis group and 5.1 days for the angina group. Now, these were the early complications that we came across. We uh, encountered two patients with acute coronary syndrome after the uh, sympathectomy was carried out for the intractable angina. There were five patients with pneumothorax, there was one with transient Horner syndrome, paresthesia, and with surprisingly, we had a low percentage of compensatory hyperhidrosis compared to uh, several other publications where the range was between 10 to almost 40 percent. <clears throat> so these were the results which were recorded, and we found that the group which underwent sympathectomy for Palmer hyperhidrosis had the highest benefit. They were very satisfied, and the angina group were well, very satisfied too in that their NYHA grading from 4 went down to 1 to 2. So these were the satisfaction outcomes. In patients with hyperhidrosis, 96% had improved. With facial flushing, we had 85% improvement. And for intractable angina, there was a 92% improvement. The follow-up was available for a mean of 67.8 months. There were five deaths in the angina group over a period of time. And out of these, only two were cardiac-related deaths. The other three <clears throat> were due to other causes lung cancer, perforated bowel, and terminal colonic cancer. In the follow-up over a period of time, we found that one patient had a unilateral persistence of sweating, as Peter has also shown in the past to me about these patients, and he underwent a redo right sympathectomy where I went higher up to find the um, sympathetic chain to excise it. The facial flushing group are a little bit tricky. They come back with residual facial flushing a year to two years after the operative procedure, and I'm a little loath to take on this group of patients. So 18% had compensatory hyperhidrosis, but none found this complication really to affect their quality of life because they had it mainly on their backs and on their trunk and their palms were invariably very dry. Post-thoracoscopic pain is also something that we encountered. And we actually had one who had um, referral to the pain clinic for further management. So, in summary, I think this is a high clinical value procedure. We need to continue to do this. We need to make sure that vascular surgeons don't meddle in the chest. And this is a really simple operation with a very short learning curve. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>